Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studios online lunchtime talk. These are live every Friday at 1pm, beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary and I'm the Pervasive Media Studios creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. An especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. Uh, for all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. So the Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, everything from comedy to coding, product development to performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas and companies and a meeting place of both the creative and commercial industries. We're a studio space. We offer desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities all for free for our residents. And most of all, we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. This week's talk is by John Troyer, the director of the Centre for Death and Society at the University of Bath. He'll be talking about how we can negotiate the p politics of memorialization and about how the dead body can function as a technology of memory. Now, a brief content warning, John will, perhaps unsurprisingly, be talking about death. He'll also be discussing both the COVID-19 and AIDS pandemics, as well as last year's Black Lives Matter protests, both in Bristol and in the US. There won't be any graphic imagery, but if you find any of those topics particularly upsetting, you might want to sit this one out. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the talk, running at round about 35-40 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just pop them into that chat window. I'll pick them out to ask John. Or if you like, you can tweet your questions to at PM Studio UK. A captioned version of this talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Now, before we start, next week's talk is by performer Roxana Vilk and researcher Liam Berthels. They'll be talking about their new collaboration, Circle slash Dalira, exploring inclusion, immersive experience and shared space. They'll also be talking about the new wearable user interface they've been building for li live composing with light and sound. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or you can subscribe to the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Hit that button, give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please feel free to share this link now on any of your socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to John. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to today's uh, talk. I really appreciate it. Um, as Martin said, my name is uh, Dr. John Troyer. I'm the director of the Center for Death and Society. Um, and I've had a longstanding relationship with the Pervasive Media Studio over a number of years, uh, going all the way back um, to almost 10 years ago now, which I can't believe it's been that long, but it has. Uh, with the React program and something uh, of a continuing project that sort of shows up and disappears and shows up again called the Future Cemetery Project, which is where I started doing a lot of my work around um, death dying and uh, cemetery technology, what the future of cemeteries might be. However, I'm not talking about that today. Today, what I'm talking about are memorials and memorialization and uh, the politics, I think, that go into design and what memorials would would look like or can look like. So um, very quickly, oops, let me get the right button. There we go. So the Center for Death and Society uh, at the University of uh, Bath was founded in 2005. And basically uh, the CDAS, as you'll hear me refer to, is an interdisciplinary studies research center. And we specialize in all areas related to death, dying and the dead body. I've, I've been uh, in the UK for 12 years now, um, because as you can tell, I'm not originally from the UK, uh, any part of it. I'm actually from the great state of Wisconsin, uh, in, in North America, and I think I put this map on here. I, oh, no, hang on, I didn't. Oh, one second. Uh, and uh, the, the most important thing to know about my, um, really, I guess my upbringing that everyone wants to know about is my dad was a funeral director. So uh, I grew up around the funeral industry that didn't really have a huge impact on how I ended up doing what I do, but it certainly has a relationship to it. So nonetheless, death has just been something I grew up around um, itself. If you're interested in, in the Center for Death and Society, you can certainly find information about us uh, on the web as well as on Twitter. Um, very briefly, because MIT Press would really love me to say this, um, and I'm happy, but proud of it too. I did have a book that came out a year ago right now uh, around uh, death, dying, and technology. Um, a bit about memorialization, not as much as you might think. Some of the memorialization research 
I'm talking about today actually goes back to my PhD years when I started looking at this. However, there is there is material I cover, uh, particularly around the AIDS epidemic that's in the book. So if you're interested in, in today's talk, by all means, please find my book. Uh, it's available in all the different places um, that way. Coming back to where I'm from. So I am from the America. This is a, a map I've used in different talks. So if you've ever seen me talk before, you will see this map, but it is useful. So uh, America is a big country. I am from the state of Wisconsin, which is up in the north uh, on the border with Canada in the middle. And this is a data project by Mental Floss in which they took the most commonly used words to say that someone had died in online obituaries and then ran the numbers. And Wisconsin was called home. If you want to know where that is, up in the middle, right up there. So that's where I'm from. Um, other states had other ways of uh, doing it this way. This is an, also an interesting look at what you can do with different data projects if you want to around death and dying. We have many, many ways to approach that topic um, that way if you're interested in, in data and um, uh, topics that way. So uh, today's talk is really about uh, monuments and memorials and memorialization and politics and memorialization. And I want to start with actually kind of a, a really an important key text. There's, there's a couple of key ideas I want to, I just want to lay out before we start talking about examples of, of I think, current and contemporary monuments and memorials. And really one of the, one of the most important texts and those of us who work around monuments and memorials or monumentalization and memorialization, we will know about it, but a lot of people don't. And it's a, it's a text by Alois Regal, who was conservative general of monuments in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And he was tasked with surveying all the monuments, and that was just a term that was used, in the, in the empire in the late 19th and early 20th century. And so in 1903, he publishes uh, a report. So this is, a, this is a civil service bureaucratic administrative report called The Mo Modern Cult of Monuments, Its Character and Its Origins its origin. And what he was tasked with was figuring out what to do or make a recommendation on what to do with all the monuments to the empire that were within the Austro-Hungarian empire. And so what he comes up with is he says, there are basically two kinds of monuments that exist now. You have intentional and you have unintentional monuments. And this was his language. And what he'll say is intentional monuments were built by the creators with an intended function to monumentalize some, some event, some person, whatever it might be. Unintentional monuments are ones that are there but change over time. And he says the reason this is is because an intentional monument is dependent on people's memories, knowing what it's there for. But actually, that's not anything you can guarantee. So in many cases, what intentional monuments end up becoming is unintentional monuments to something else but that because they they sort of escape the physical object escapes the memory but the thing is still there and it creates a whole new meaning for what monuments are the whole point with this and i think this was his sort of his key observation many years before i think a lot of us who would think about monuments and memorials realize that is he said what he'll say is monuments and by an ex, by extension a kind of memorial which he he more or less is alluding to in a kind of intentional sense they change over time they change over time they change with with the environments in which they exist they change with the people with in which they are around there's no guarantee there's no guarantee that the meaning will persist and that that was one of his his key contributions to the whole to that whole area. Now, in the in sort of the publicity for this talk, but also another key text jumps all the way now to 1997, uh, comes from Marita Sturkin, who wrote a really important book called Tangled Memories: The Vietnam War, The AIDS Epidemic, and the, the Politics and Remembering of Remembering. And what Marita Sturkin will say is monuments and memorials, but memorials more specifically. So here we're talking about memorials specifically. What she'll say is op op represent a kind of technology or become technologies of memory. And what that means is cultural memory is produced through objects, images, and representations. These are technologies of memory, not vessels of memory, in which memory passively resides so much as objects through which memories are shared, produce given meaning. Her point is that things like memorials do not have a kind of passive mem memory sense to them. They're actively engaged with memory, with human memory, and they're actively engaged in sharing and producing, giving new meaning to what those memories might be. And that to, I think to expect or, or to think that memorials of any kind, monuments for that matter too, could in fact escape that kind of memory production, that meaning production is, um, is incorrect. 
And that, that it is entirely expected, I think, that humans, we humans, would develop new meanings through an active process of, of making meaning and uh, you know mem memories through memorials themselves. So what we have is we have sort of two, two tw early 20th century, late 20th century, I think points in what we're talking about, intentional and unintentional monuments, and then these sort of technologies of memory around monuments and memorials themselves. And I think th those sort of wide spectrum of points cover a lot of where we're headed into with the memorializations themselves. Now, my background in this is, uh, has been around the architecture and design of memorials, but I've also spent a lot of time, and some of you may have heard me talk about this in the past, around memorial tattoos, so just very briefly. And memorial tattoos are oftentimes a, a tattoo, for example, in which after a person has died, and this is the most explicit involvement of something like a dead body, they create a memorial through a tattoo on their body. This is a, a tattoo that a, um, uh, a young mother sent to me after her, uh, her uh, uh, baby Addison had died and she's giving me full permission to use this in which uh, what she had done and you'll see the footprint on there she'd done a transfer of the inked footprint after her daughter had died uh, and then as is common with a lot of memorial tattoos I'm not always common but you do find this had uh, mixed in just a, a small pinch of some of the cremated remains into the ink which didn't do anything to the tattoo but this becomes a way to memorialize the deceased that way so that's one form particularly the dead um, this is a, a, a woman who had a very elaborate uh, memorial tattoo on her back. Uh, I was talking to her about it and she said that I, I, I just asked, is that a memorial tattoo for your, for your family? Because it's so you know, put together. And uh, she said, yes, it is. And so that's actually the entire family tree of her family, but using um, different um, birds and butterflies in different groups to represent different family members that way. So you can find these tattoos in lots of different ways. I'm not going to be talking about tattooing today. All I'm saying is that tattoos represent a very specific kind of form of memorialization um, that I've, I've always found intriguing and really led me into a lot of this work, particularly how we represent the, the dead loved one or deceased you know, friend or family member uh, with our body. But what I want to talk about is more around monuments and memorials today. And by today, I mean like today, like, so like what's going on? So we've got on the one hand, something like the new National COVID Memorial Wall in London, and there's a big push right now. So how do we, how do we memorialize COVID-19 if we do? How do we humans come to represent just yesterday, of the day, like some point yesterday, we passed 4 million dead. What does that mean? How does that come to be represented? Um, as a global pandemic. And I'll come back to COVID at the very end of the talk, but it is an ongoing issue. It's not going to go anywhere. And I think we should all be expecting um, to be, you know, thinking about um, precisely these issues for, for many years to come. Uh, as I've explained to my own undergraduate students, you know, there will come a time when no one will know what you're talking about and you'll have to explain it to them. Um, and to which they think that just sounds preposterous because of course, you know, everyone's lives have been completely you know, dislodged or disorganized. And in many cases, people have had family members die. So that's been the most traumatic of, of deaths. But, you know, there'll come a time when people won't automatically know what you're talking about. Um, and so memorials come to occupy both a space to remember the dead, but also to signify that these events happen. Um, and it's a real mixed bag as to what these national kind of memorials will be. The, the National COVID Memorial London, for those who don't know, um, is not a, if you will, um, state sanctioned more, uh, memorial in a sense. It was one that family members um, just decided to do without anyone's permission, uh, right across from uh, Westminster, across the Thames in London, uh, in the Borough of Lewisham. And it's on the wall, it's open, it's public there. And it is extremely long. And they've come to represent all of the UK dead through volunteers putting little hearts on there. What has happened is you'll see this on there is people have gone up to, to the wall itself and begun writing the names um, of the deceased in the hearts, little memories, and then leaving objects to them. And we'll come back to both names and objects in a second, but that th this is how this, if you will, National COVID Memorial was founded as, um, and I, this is not being too global, trying to be global about it, a guerrilla art project in which suddenly you had family members and friends and families that we're going to lay claim to this uh, while we're going to do it that way. So that's that's one sphere where we are. We also have now, in case I'm going to make everyone in, in Bristol very jittery, we also have an exhibition at the M Shed, which of course, this is a statue of, of the Colson statue um, that was uh, pulled down last summer uh, during um, 
Black Lives Matter protests. And the, the what is striking about, I think, this exhibition um, is this was, in my mind, exactly what you would expect to see in many cases with changes over meaning and what different objects and, you know, personages, histories mean to different groups as different understandings of the past change. And that, that something like this exhibition is exactly what um, Alois Regal had in mind in the early 20th century in which he said, you have these intentional and you have these unintentional monuments and that you come into a conflict with these politics uh, and that to expect that the meaning to remain static is absolutely incorrect. And so when you get into something like the, the exhibition of Colson statue, I, I was in America when this all happened, although I live in Bristol normally. And I remember talking to uh, my parents about it. And I said, I, I'll tell you what's going to happen right now is I expect there will be an exhibition around memorialization and monuments and whatever it might be, particularly with the statue and protests protests being a very important part of the history of Bristol, and that that is exactly what you would, in many ways, I think, want to see in trying to open up the broader politics of what's going on. And that, that is part and parcel of the long history, certainly of the 20th century, if not into the 21st century of monuments and memorials. So I keep using the terms monuments and memorials, why are they? Well, this is, I think, one of the one of the better descriptions of this. So here you have Arthur Danto, who was reflecting on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. And this is 1985 when that memorial opens. And what Danto says is we erect monuments so that we shall always remember and build memorials so that we shall never forget. Thus we have the Washington Monument, but the Lincoln Memorial. Monuments commemorate the memorable and embody the myths of beginnings. Uh, memorials ritualize remembrance and mark the reality of ends. And so there is this tension that exists, quite frankly, between monuments and memorials, where monuments are there to, without being too, um, I, again, sort of like too glib about it, to monumentalize the past, uh, really represent a kind of mythic, in many cases, meaning, you know, it didn't happen, but it becomes this myth of something or other that would have occurred. Whereas memorials are, are, are usually much more there to remember, um, you know, something that had, um, remembrance of, of an end, of death, dying, people who are gone. Um, whereas, you know, monuments tend to, to never reflect anything that might be regarded in their initial phase as being a kind of failure. Rarely do we monumentalize failures of any kind. Memorials are often there to sort of reflect upon or critically, critically engage with some kind of failure, whatever that might be. And that can get, again, political and complicated, but nonetheless, there is a tension that exists between how do we represent what these monuments might be and how do they change over time? The same thing with memorials. So uh, Dante talks about the Washington Monument, and this is the Washington Monument in DC. Um, which if you've never been to the, the National Mall in DC, it's worth going just to see kind of what monuments and memorials in a, in a country can look like kind of run amok. I mean, it, it really is an expansive space of nothing but monuments and memorials. I mean, they're impressive in many ways. And it, it, it's actually become a, a, a heated political issue right now because the Parks Commission, the Monuments Commission, which oversees it, has decided there's no more space for more monuments, memorials, physical space there, which, which I, I'll be frank with you, has led many vets and veterans and families groups who've been part of what we described during the George W. Bush administration as the global war on terrorism uh, with the wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan, asking, well, where will our memorial be for those of our dead? particularly as we see, we're now seeing the winding down of the West's involvement in, in Afghanistan. So I come back now to the Washington Monument. This is an older one. And of course, it's just, just you know, there's no way around it. Just an enormous phallic symbol, <laughs> this huge phallus right in the middle of the mall. Um, but the reason I wanted to show it was one, people get a sense of what it is, but also just to show you how quickly, you know, meanings change for different people. So the, the red lights you see at the top are added, um, uh, obviously many years after its original construction or you know, too far down the road, in part to, to alert air traffic and to make it visible uh, for different, um, you know, make it visible so as to avoid you know, collisions. I was working in Washington, D.C. in 1995, in the mid-90s for a, a MP, a congressman um, from Minneapolis there. And um, I was walking around Washington with a friend of mine, um, Stephanie, who is African American, and we were talking about DC. And Washington, DC is a is a peculiar city because it is 
it is a predominantly um, what would be described as black city. The majority of the population are black. Um, however, the power center is largely in DC um, through both the, the House of Representatives and the Senate, which is largely white. And this there's this dichotomy of power that's been played out in lots of different ways, it involves pushes for say whatever it might be. Uh, and Stephanie and I were talking about it. She said, you know, when I was a, when I was a little girl, so growing up black in D.C., and you're still in the South, you're, you're not in the state of Virginia, but you're in the District of Columbia, which is the side of it. What she said was, when I was a little girl growing up, you know, really in the South, every time I saw the Washington Monument, particularly at night, it looked like a giant Klan member to me. Every time I saw it, I just thought I was looking at this gigantic towering Ku Klux Klan member. Uh, and we were talking about it. I said, absolutely. I totally 100% see exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and that had not been my lived experience to say the least. I would never have thought about that. But she said, yeah, I mean, there was no way to escape it. Like that was just the way it, it, it appeared. And I've always reflected on that, that experience because here you have this monument, which of course is you know, George Washington and to a certain extent of, you know, the, the, the heroic foundations of the country, um, but to a large part of the American, you know, population, um, it is, it, it is, has a slightly terrifying resonance, both in real terms historically, but also just symbolically in how it appears. Um, now that there could be a discussion about whether that was intended or not, but it's certainly there. And I think to try and pretend like it's not is, uh, you know, foolish and just, you know, adds to further levels of, um, uh, you know, trauma that have, are already in place. So that's the Washington Monument. This is the Lincoln Memorial. Most of you will have seen it. It, is, it has perhaps become the most used and somewhat, some historians would argue abused backdrop uh, for different um, uh, you know, political groupings, uh, certainly in the televised era. Um, and you know, in many cases, depending on what's going on. So nonetheless, the Lincoln Memorial itself, which is further along sort of an endpoint, Washington Monument is sort of midway between the, the, the Capitol building and then the Lincoln Memorial. And so it's come to represent this, you know, this memorial form of you know, all possible meanings and you know, remembering the dead or whatever that might be that way. This is a Vietnam War Memorial, and this is what that Danto was reflecting on when he wrote about this in 1985. In fact, you'll see the Washington Monument then off in the background for that. And the, the thing to just point out about the, the, the Vietnam War Memorial as a, a contemporary memorial was that when it is, when it is first selected, this is Maya Lin's uh, first uh, design. Maya Lin is a now world-renowned architect and designer of memorials, but also other objects. This was Maya Lin's first uh, design. She was still an undergraduate at the time, had submitted it because she'd been working on a, a funereal and sort of memorial design course in architecture, sent it from her dorm room. I mean, there's all kinds of stories that are going here. And what, what made, what, what has now come to be a embraced and celebrated part of the, the Vietnam War Memorial is the listing of all the names of the dead uh, on the black granite. And you sort of descend down into it and you see all the names. Um, it has in many ways become a much beloved memorial, but it was that was not the way it was described when it was first um, first revealed uh, in Washington D.C. In fact, it was much derided uh, as being defeatist, um, as as not celebrating, if you will, uh, the heroism of war. And actually, what it was doing was just pointing out the sheer volume of the fact that so many people had died. And this is just on the American side. This isn't even before we get to all the individuals who are, who are Vietnamese who also then died or Laos or Cambodia or any number of, of those parts of the world. Uh, but this sets, this sets a kind of, if you will, template for this idea that you want to both enumerate the dead so you can get a visual sense of how many we're talking about, but you also want to name them so that we know this is a person who died and we know their name. Now there's, there's a, there's, a, a dilemma here, and this goes all the way back to Regal, which is that is your intention, right? But all those individuals will only be known by name as long as there are people who still know them. And that becomes one of the dilemmas with so many of the namings of individuals that go into this is that there's a finite amount of space involved into a, in so many of the individuals who are dead. Uh, before they just largely become anonymous. And it becomes a kind of different kind of memorial when, once it enters into the anonymity. 
So then we get into in intentional and unintentional monument conflicts. And this is where I think that this is where we really begin to see in some ways the, the work around Colson, but also Black Lives Matter protests in America and protests around uh, Confederate war statues uh, and statues around political events. And the conflicts are such that these, these monuments will have been built with one intention, but that they also then, in, because of changing politics and cultural attitudes, unintentionally, and you could say perhaps intentionally, but unintentionally become a monument to something quite different. And it's something that many people simply say is, is you know, needs to be reevaluated. So that brings us back to Colston. And I think reevaluating, you know, the history of, of uh, enslavement, but also the history of commerce, any number of points that we brought up, but also Victorian rethinking, um, you know, of what these different points were supposed to be. In the United States, and this is a different context, and some of you will know this, I'm sure, but you know, the US has got an enormous number of monuments and memorials built to, to heroicize the Confederate you know, Southern army um, that attempted to, or did stage a civil war against the Northern part of the States. And so, and this has been an ongoing issue for many, many decades. This is not a new issue, but it has been, I think, been brought to the fore as more and more people finally just said, you know, enough. Uh, and largely, you know, many Black Americans and all kinds of African American communities for decades have been saying, you know, this is just, it's inappropriate. Like, it's not, this is not a reflection of the communities of who we are. And so this is a Richmond, Virginia. This is a statue of Robert E. Lee. And to, to give it a sense of, of, these, of these monuments in the city of Richmond, which is where the Confederate army, the Confederate power base was, they're everywhere across these sort of grand boulevards and they're enormous. Uh, and um, I was really struck when I was in Richmond a number of years ago to visit some friends who are who are academics there, because uh, I'd known about some of these, uh, you know, monuments to the Confederate uh, military, but or to the, you know really individuals who were trying to overthrow the U.S. government. Um, but it was it, it doesn't really strike you until you see just on the scale that they are everywhere where they are, and and really what a celebration of an attempt to you know overthrow a country it 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 becomes. And I'll give you another example because this would this would be a bigger example, one that'd be more publicized of, of um, you know, different approaches to before statues are taken down. And this was during the Black Lives Matter protests last summer, um, but also in even the cemeteries. So this is Hollywood Cemetery, which is the main cemetery in Richmond. You know, there is something called Confederate Avenue, and in Confederate Avenue, there is a monument to the Confederate war dead. Again, another enormous. This is more of a pyramid as opposed to like an obelisk, you know, phallus coming on the ground. But this is a a, a built, uh, you know, to the Confederate war dead. Uh, monument that's there that these are you know monuments that are there to 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 glorify precisely this kind of dead um uh dead soldier who was there to um in many cases try to you know defeat um the country that they they were inhabiting now what's also crucial is understand that it's much more complicated at times too so in the same cemetery you also then have a memorial to all the jewish confederate war dead and I'm only flagging this up because in so much of the way that neo-Confederacy politics have taken shape in America, it's rapidly anti-Semitic. Uh, and anti-Semitism has really become a part of the politics of, of so much of what would be thought of as sort of like neo-new lost cause, and I don't have time to get into that, um, but white nationalist politics in America, which is not a new thing, but it's certainly taken shape in, in America in different ways. But you can still find these Confederate, you can find these memorials in, in the South to individuals who died um, in all different kinds of faith groups, right? That would necessarily today necessarily not be remembered at all as being part of it, actually be regarded as part of the problem. Um, and so when we, we start to talk about these intentional, unintentional conflicts, I think it's important to keep in mind that the politics of this will always begin to make different, will, will, will make a political sense of the different kinds of bodies in such a way um, that it is almost by definition bound to be engaged in conflict. And I think that is, I think that is part of uh, this idea of there not being any kind of like neutral memorial or neutral monument. This this approach of some kind of neutrality around that, I think, is is um, is misguided because I, I'm not, I'm just not convinced that it's necessarily possible, desirable, or that it's going to happen. So now we can talk about different kinds of memorials for the dead that perhaps shift away from 
from some of the politics, but I don't think necessarily, I think there's still a politics involved in some of this because you're never that far away from it. And these are more common memorials that some of us will have seen in, in different ways. So for example, many of you will be more familiar with um, ghost bikes. And these are, these are bikes that are painted white that are usually changed or chained or attached to where an individual has died. Um, often they are impermanent um, and they actually will, in many cases, disappear over time, either removed by local officials because it's an unsanctioned uh, memorial or they'll just, the families will take it down or they just disappear because uh, you know things disappear. This was one in Bath where a young man died, um, which is, um, no longer there, um, but it was there for a time. This is a, a ghost bike that is in Manchester uh, that is a bit more permanent. Now, the city of London, uh, a few years back, uh, while Boris Johnson uh, was mayor, began a system of trying to create more permanent uh, ghost bike permits. Um, where the ghost bike started, no one really quite knows. There are maps around to try and find them in different places, and, and how do you do it? But You'll see them all around the world. This was one that is a, that is a bit more permanent. You can tell there's more upkeep in the city of Austin, Texas. So if any of you go to uh, South by Southwest ever, you can find this uh, sort of walking uh, towards uh, the city center from outside of town uh, along that way. And the ghost bikes are there just simply to you know memorialize someone who died in a biking accident. Um, but again, it's their ephemerality. It's the fact that they're there and they disappear but you'll know that they're there. It's actually also been related to some case roadside memorials where someone has died as part of a roadside accident, both of which have caused all kinds of um, political consternation, particularly around cities, because what they'll say is, um, you know, one of the reasons that, that families will be told you can't put a memorial there is it will cause further accidents because people will be looking at the memorial and not paying attention to the road or whatever it might be. Families will say, no, we need to do this so people know this is an unsafe or dangerous you know, bit of, of road wire travel or whatever it might be. So there becomes a kind of commitment to saying, this is where so one of our loved ones died and we want people to know it, one, to remember them, but two, to point out that this could be a dangerous place that way. We've also then got different kinds of memorials, and I threw these in because I came across these um, in Hawaii a number of years ago, which is um, you oftentimes have memorials that are put together by individuals, for example, who die in uh, surfing accidents. And that's a, in the surfing community, this becomes a common kind of memorial you find. And there was one particular beach in Hawaii where over the years, a number of, of people had died, but friends and family had come along and um, done the upkeep to just keep people alive, but also to warn people that potentially the conditions could become dangerous. And this is a, a, a sort of a smaller one, but clearly new flowers have just been put down that way. Okay, so a lot of it, we're check on the time. Okay, we're good. A lot of this um, then stems from, I think, in the, in the contemporary sense of monuments, but also memorialization more specifically and the politics around it. And this has always been, in some ways, the foundation of what I'm interested in comes from a lot of uh, HIV AIDS protests in the 1980s and 1990s. And I think the politics of HIV AIDS um, which um, uh, to a certain extent you saw glimpses of in It's a Sin, which was on this last winter. But even then, I think that, it, that we could have a discussion about that. But nonetheless, there was a politics around, you know, protesting HIV AIDS and a lack of attention paid to it, but also pandemic. And it was through different kinds of different social groups. This was just um, the work I had done is about funeral directors and how they responded to AIDS back in the 19, late 80s and early 90s. And it, it created all kinds of havoc in the funeral industry initially, um, not totally dissimilar to some of the havoc we saw with COVID in the funeral industry, although the COVID, I think the funeral industry funeral directors learned many lessons from AIDS, whether they learned it or not, and were actually able to use those uh, with COVID in many ways, but that there was a real sense that, that something like AIDS or a viral contagion had changed things. Uh, and that suddenly there was, there was a necessity for a new kind of politics to think about how do we address the inequality and the politics going on in trying to, in many cases, just erase the fact that someone died of AIDS. So you had a large, you know, number of protests, least of which one of the biggest groups was ACT UP or the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. I'm moving very quickly here through AIDS activism. So if any of my AIDS activist friends are watching this, I apologize because I know I'm moving quickly. But there were protests that went on, um, particularly around um, drug, um, access to drugs, access to care. Uh, and I, I'm just going to say this is a very ironic footnote. Um, this is 
in the early 80s is when a, a, a young researcher at the time named Dr. Uh, Anthony Fauci or Tony Fauci becomes involved in this, someone we all know today, and who took this seriously. And he was actually one of the, the researchers who through you know, fits and starts began to open the door to researchers uh, from activist groups. So from ACT UP, it was called the Science Club, they called themselves, to try and open up different approaches to, to medicine and to create like expanded access, earlier access to drugs, uh, which had some successes and some failures, but nonetheless the idea was we need to rethink what we think of these, of the, of these protocols. Um, and you know it was precisely it was precisely that that idea of expanded access, but also of trying to think differently about how you can still have regulated, standardized testing, but do it in such a way that it is done more quickly for to benefit the like the whole population and not just certain groups. So, for example, historically, um, black women would have been left out of a lot of the early testing around. AIDS, HIV drugs, but that was a shift that was put forward then later on to identify groups that were just not being even thought of. Um, we saw this with, with COVID vaccines. We saw, we saw in many ways this idea of how can we approach this um, differently that comes out of these protests. Uh, and there's a real, I think there's a real um, debt of thanks to go to a lot of the re, uh, these activists around HIV AIDS, many of whom are dead, uh, many of them didn't make it. Um, but that they, you know, they really set a template for what could go on. And there was, there was a real, uh, you know, real rage of protests around this, around trying to draw attention to the fact that so many individuals are dying in both, um, uh, you know, across LGBTQ communities and that it was something that was just not being addressed by the governments. So how do you draw attention to it? Well, this of course becomes one of the great pol political forms of protest, um, the die-in, which has always had a strong legacy across um, 1970s politics and protests, uh, and how do you draw attention to the fact that people are dying? Will you actually have a you know symbolic die, a you know, group of people dying in across the street to create direct action and, and you know in effect civil disobedience? Now that was one form. Now the other form that comes up then, of course, is the memorialization. So this becomes one of the dominant forms of memorialization for the for the AIDS epidemic, um, and you'll find a bit of a split here between the activist community said, "Well, no, we need much more direct action." By direct action, when I I mean, there was a whole protest in which uh, family members, friends and family who'd lost someone to AIDS, they took the urns of ashes and they began dumping them at the, the White House. And they, they began taking the cremated remains as a form of protest and memorialization out of rage and anger and said, we're going to leave our loved ones here because you're not doing anything. Now that was one form. The other form was then the AIDS quilt and the AIDS quilt became a very important form because what it was, it was a large scale project. This is in, in um, um, Central Park in 1998, I believe it was off the top of my head. And that this was a demonstration of the quilt, what the quilt was, I'm sorry, that's Washington DC, 1998, pardon me, 1988, Washington DC. This is Central Park in 1993. And what the quilt was is it was, it became about 50,000 different squares. And we'll see some close up slides of it in just a second that are three feet, three foot by six feet panels. And again, we'll get a close up in just a second, each representing someone who had died. There is a, is, was, still remains a UK AIDS quilt. Uh, it was on display in 1994 for the last time in Hyde Park. And you can find, uh, uh, video of this and what it looked like um, today still uh, on on YouTube uh, through um, different groups and, and it, it what it what it accomplished was it drew attention to the sheer scale of the individuals who were dying. This is the last time the whole thing was unfurled uh, and that was in 1996 in Washington DC. Again, that's the monument about midway where the photo stops would again be the Washington. Um, the, the Capitol building would be the Washington Monument. Um, and this is an aerial view of what it looks like, it looked like in 2014. This is a cutout um, of some of the squares that was, was put on display in New York. And I happened to be in New York in 2014 uh, and read about it, it actually through someone's blog. It was not publicized at all. And this is a close up of what the quilt looks like. So here you have the three foot by six foot panels. Each one represents a person. Each panel is about the size of a grave. That was a point of it. It initially started out as being, um, uh, if you very, I, I would say, um, uh, slimmed down the design. Many of the earliest um, of the earliest panels 
oftentimes it was just the person's name spray painted onto a, a piece of fabric. Uh, but then they became more and more uh, elaborate over time as people began sending in panels to the Names Foundation in uh, San Francisco, where it was initially housed there in, in the Castro. But the point was it became this large, um, unassailable and quite moving if you ever saw it, um, or even still see pieces of it, but quite moving um, large scale memorial to give you just a sense going back to Maya Lin's notion of the names capturing some of the scale, the scale of the death, right? As you began to see a dead person in every, every panel. Uh, as you went by. Um, and, and that became a quite important moment, I think, both in terms of activist memorialization, but also a form of direct action and memorialization in which it was uh, individuals who finally just said, we're going to do this and we need to remember the dead. Now, in 2014, <clears throat> when I saw, it, the, again, the aerial shot, 2014, 1996, Washington, D.C., 1993 Central Park, New York, huge exhibition. 2014, back in New York, close up, it was on Governor's Island. And Governor's Island's off the southern tip of Manhattan. It was, uh, it's been, Governor's Island's been used as a sort of, you know, arts and, and um, uh, sort of events space now, been rehabilitated. It's so the federal park. You have to take a, a ferry to get there. But what I was so struck by in seeing the AIDS, the, the, the AIDS quilt as a memorial object on Governor's Island in 2014 was um, how different things had become politically. Because now the quilt was no longer in display in Central Park. It was on an island that was barely publicized that I just happened to hear about because I'd seen something on you know, someone's blog. Um, and I'll be frank with you, it, it, felt, it felt like a plague island. It felt like here you had an island that uh, the individuals who died of AIDS were being put, um, which had huge echoes of things you actually heard back in the 1980s about what do we do with other people with AIDS? We just put them in a you know, camp, something like that, uh, put them on an island. And, and I was struck by the politics of this, of that, of that how quickly, um, you know, intentionally this, this memorial was built. Unintentionally, it began to show just how um, easy it was um, to see things move. Now, I was talking to a radio producer about this, and she said, you know, well, th that seems to me that shows like that's progress, isn't it? That people have, have, you know, so adapted to something like AIDS. And I said, maybe, although maybe it's just because we just don't think about AIDS as still being something that's with us, that we've forgotten about it, that it's still a pandemic. It's still, people are still dying from it, but not in the West. And so it's become kind of a larger thing that way. So that then brings me to COVID-19 and memorials. And we're gonna end on this because this is very much about the history of the present, right? So what do we do with COVID-19 memorials? They began to spring up almost as soon as people began, I think, recognizing that individuals are dying from them. So one thing that we've seen has been the ubiquitous face mask and what that might look like, what that could become. Um, murals of them. I know objects are being collected by all the different museums and historical societies, and that's going on. And certainly Bristol Museum is collecting objects. And I know this because I have friends who are curators who are doing it, but I think that makes good sense. You want to collect everything. You want to collect everything. Um, there are also then um, been digital memorials that have been created. This was actually one of the earliest ones. It's no longer being used, but actually was one of the most effective. And this was on the Nursing Notes website. And what it was is they were creating a, using basically just mapping tools on Google Maps, um, different individuals, you see the color code at the bottom, different people within the NHS and medical community who had died, social care community who died of COVID. And every day they would update it across the entire country. Um, and it, at a certain point, it just became too complicated to do, but this was toward the end of what it, what it looked like. You can go to the Nursing Notes website and see sort of where it ended, but it became this growing map, if you will, of how everyone who had died. And actually, too, I think fittingly had that sort of like, you know, mapping, you know, heart tool, which brings me to the, finally the National Kevin Memorial in, in D.C. and the politics of what goes on with that. This is a memorial, arguably, I think that is here to stay. I can't imagine it's going to any, um, any 
local or national governments going to want to in any way remove this. There's also a question about should there actually be a UK national memorial or is it better left for it not to be national in a sense, but I mean left to local groups to do it that way. That's an open debate and that's a question that we're all going to have to think about. But politically what I think is so important about this is that I think over time, what will become understood was that this was a memorial that was started at scale to represent everyone who had died and that every single one of those hearts is someone who had died, is a name, the names are being filled in and that the families who did this, did this because what they felt was we are not being shown respect for the fact that these individuals died and that we're not gonna sit around and wait for a memorial to be built, we're going to do it ourselves. And there can be pros and cons to that. However, what I'm going to say is, that is, I think, if anything, the history of memorializing the dead, particularly when you start to talk about thinking about the history of activism around trying to draw attention to the fact people are dying, because there are different, if you will, government actors or different groups around the world who are not paying attention to that. And that, that if anyone was surprised by the, form, the creation of something like the National Covenant Memorial Wall, then they, I, I just don't think they've been paying attention to the history of how quickly events can accumulate around the dead and that there's a real compunction and a compulsion to remember the dead in just these ways. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. I don't take any was, questions. That was really good. And yeah, if anyone got any questions for John, just, just pop them in the chat there. I'll pull them out. Well, ask. Sure, but stop, I, I, stop the sharing there, uh, Martin. Yeah, good, you're good, you're good. Um, okay. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kick off though with a question I had, sort of talking a, a little bit of what you were touching on at the end. There's, it seems like, particularly with the the AIDS quilt, that's a very, you know, it's a movable thing. It can be picked up and put somewhere, right. and uh, the online um, uh, memorials are, you know. The internet is not forever, or you know, despite yeah. what people might say, right, the, yeah, a yeah. website is a very ephemeral thing compared to right. uh, most uh, memorials. So, I guess, what what do you see it meaning when we decide to physically put something in public space? And like, do you think there's a value to these less permanent memorials? Yeah, well, no, of course. I mean, I do think you're. So, I, I didn't. There's a whole other, a whole other talk or research I could go into like how nothing on the internet will be around <laughs> like which is which is true and I think that you know there is a so there you can't the the AIDS quilt itself uh became too large to actually unfurl so that's why the last time it was ever undone at one time was 1996. It is online you can find um you know scans of it and there are actually physical um you can go see physical um uh, panels of it in different places, uh, including in London. You can find places where parts of it are, are on display. But the whole thing, no. Now, as far as is there value to the, like the physical object of the of these objects being put up? I think um, I think there is. I I certainly think that you know depending on what they're supposed to be. But going all the way back to what Regal was talking about in nineteen like nineteen oh three. Um, putting up the physical object means you have to accept that over time no one will know what it's about after a while and that it will very much become you know a product of of the imaginary or shifts in politics of what you know people you know the way that they approach life in whatever period in which they're living and and i think that that is um i think that you know that's part of it uh, there's a different question about you know public funding and money being spent and whatever that might be. And also to, you know, like, what do you know, like, what do we want out of, you know, public memorials for the dead? Because that's always a contentious issue too, right? Anytime you start to say like, let's, let's, you know, we should rethink whatever this, this memorial is, or we should put one up that opens up a whole, you know, kind of, you know, can of worms as well as, as, as it should, and you would expect. So I think that, um, I think there can be value to doing it, but I think that the, in many cases, um, there's a growing kind of argument that maybe national memorials are something that are are um, no longer as of much use. That really, what what is of more use are very local memorials, where local communities are kind of coming together uh, to to build memorials, and those are very ephemeral. And I think that they 
because they're so ephemeral, um, not only do they change in meaning, I think this gets to the crux you're asking, they do disappear, they go away. And, I, and is there value in that? I think there is, I do, honestly. Um, but I think also to, it, it depends. Family members will say, some, some family members will say, I like having this place, I know I can go. Others will be like, I don't ever want to go there. And some will be, you know, have a kind of ambivalence. So if it disappears, then that's okay too. So it's, you know, it's all over the place. But the, you know, memorials disappear all the time. That's why, that's why in some ways I like the ghost bikes because they're there, but then they'll, they'll be gone. But you'll still remember it was there if you ever bike by a place that had one. I certainly do. I mean, maybe that's just me. I don't want to project into the audience, but you know that way. Great. Uh, so we got a question here from the other way works. Uh, do national memorials usually get put up after something has concluded? And what happens if things never really properly conclude, as may be the case with COVID yeah. or or AIDS, indeed? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, usually, well, that's a great question. So do you put up a memorial in the middle of something happening? You generally know it is usually after the fact, but if it is still continuing when you do it, but even then, so for example, there are very few memorials to the 1918 flu pandemic, almost none. And this has been like some small ones and very few national ones. Um, something, and this this will become one of the contentious topics around something like COVID, right? So where would it, where would, when is it done? That's why there's also, I think, and it's been a it's been a um, it's been a sore point with a lot of AIDS activists in the UK. Like, there's no national AIDS memorial in the UK. Um, certainly not. There's nothing in you know London to reflect it that way. And so, you know, those kinds of questions. But then, but then we come back to this question: like, if it's after the fact, then maybe it's. But then maybe that's okay because then if you're subjecting it to a kind of national like a government structure, then, well, what does that become? That's why I was talking about the National COVID Memorial, quote unquote, as it were, down, you know, in London, though it was founded by the family groups, you know, that just creates it. And now the, now there is a political challenge to this government in the UK now, but then all future governments, because they are now confronted with the fact that one, I don't think they're going to, they're not going to, try and remove it. I don't think any government that has any sense would be like, we got to tear this down, as I've mentioned. But also now too, are they going to begin contr contributing funds to for its upkeep? Um, and, and that will become an ongoing issue that way. But by and large, they're done after the fact, but even then, you know, who, who takes charge of the narrative? And that, that I think is always one of the key issues that way. Great, yeah. We do have time for a few more questions if anyone wants to get them in. But I, I want to ask. Um, so it, I was particularly struck with this with the uh, COVID memorial wall, where how it started with these anonymous red hearts, and then people felt the need to write the names of specific people, and obviously that has a, a strong resonance with the Vietnam memorial wall. But comparing that then with a lot of war memorials, who which do just say you know to the war dead or whatever and right. how what does it mean when we choose to memorialize huge numbers of individuals versus a, a sort of collective yeah I, well, I think that so there is contention there because if, so if you're going to single out everyone by name and this was my lens point you, it needs to be everyone and I think, I think in the U.S. context, that was important for Vietnam because her, her whole argument was we need to show the scale of everyone who died, as opposed to just saying we, 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 we honor everyone who collectively died, let's say, in World War II. And sometimes this gets into the politics of what a war was about. So, so if a war is deemed, let's say, historically in the moment we're in to have been done for heroic reasons or justified reasons, then, then it becomes more acceptable to make it a collective honoring. If the war is, is been deemed to have been done for unjustified or reasons that lacked um, any kind of value or a questionable value, let me be careful here, it becomes about remembering each of the dead because why did they die? And I think, I think that was the tension with Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial because she was trying to, and this was just her design, but was trying to recognize everyone who died so they could be recognized for dying. And then it becomes a question for what? And that was, that was why the opponents to it didn't like it because they said, well, it's, it's, it's asking us to ask questions about why everyone died here. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, I would say the same thing applies to the COVID memorial where people are writing the names down. And I, and so it's clear, like there were not names in the hearts. That was something that, that people just, as you really said, spontaneously began doing. And I don't even think there was necessarily anyone who said, aha, the Vietnam War Memorial, that's where they have, the, we wanna do this here too. But I think that there is this impulse to name everyone because I do think that what comes out of the COVID Memorial in London is, is our family members, friends and family saying, all these people died why why did they die um and i think that's what i think that's where politically it becomes even more urgent because there there is a possibility that that kind of memorial keeps open that question and i think it's a question we need to be asking now i'm shifting into more epidemiological, <laughs> epidemiological side of what i do but i think that is i think that's a crucial question and in this way memorials can play a very important role um to you know to in a site physically across from parliament ask questions around in what ways were these deaths preventable and what more could have been done and i think that's exactly what that memorial is doing in many ways great um from so from one controversial topic to another i, I wanted to ask a little bit about the the colston statue and sure. if i know for people of bristol this has been a a a topic of debate for some time this you know oh, years, this is this years. isn't this isn't a new thing no. um but so what does it mean when we move from like the very specific arguments around colston in bristol to this more sort of large-scale national and global debate about statues in general and memorials in general which we seem to be having yeah well i think i mean it was it, it's it, it, no one should be surprised by it. And by no one, I mean, I think no white person should be surprised by it. <laughs> I'm not being frank about it. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I'll be honest and just saying like, so I don't know, this is not, I don't know, like, let's say 10 years ago or something like that. I was down actually down on near the Colson Statue down the waterfront, kind of an area down there. I, th I actually think it was on my way over to the, to the watershed or something like that and so the person i was with pointed out that that pointed out colson statue because i'd seen burke statue i was like oh yeah burke <laughs> he supported the american revolution there we go um but then there's colson statue and i and the person i was with was like yeah he was a big slave trader and i was like what like there's a stat in bristol there's a statue to that like they just i, I was like because my my what i said was that's what they do in america We've got all these statues to all these people who effectively did terrible things during the Civil War and other places, and they're everywhere, right? And so, and for decades, those arguments have been going on, in decades, 10 plus 20 years, you could say, have been going on. And so I think that, that the reason you're beginning to see this is for lots of different reasons. One is just an assertion of a reckoning with, with, a, with a politics around historical narratives, which, which for too long, I think people, and again, we, I, it's, I think it's important to be frank here, a majority of white people are just like, okay, well, we'll just kind of go along with it, whatever. And, and finally, you just have people in different communities, usually in communities of color, so are just like, listen, this is just not, it, this is not okay anymore. And we're, it, and, you know, we're not going to be quiet about it. Um, and I, I, so I think anyone who's surprised by it, I think just hasn't been paying attention. That's why to see what happened in Bristol with you know the the toppling of the monument, as it were, to use a phrase, but of the Colson statue, I think should have surprised no one. Now people may not have liked it, but that's different than saying it shouldn't have surprised anyone. Given, and I think this is the key thing with the Colson statue, they're only too hard into it. I think given the years that were put into trying to figure out something that that's a way to do it. Now you can get into a question of well, is you know, like what are the limits around destruction of public property or, or private property where that might be? And I get all that, but what I'm saying is at a certain point, it, it should not come as a surprise that that happened. And, and certainly I wasn't surprised. Um, and, and I think a lot of people, certainly people, a lot of people I knew who were, you know, pretty politically moderate even too, would have been like, I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner um, as far as that goes. So I think that once you, once you get into the opening up the, you know, the political questions around how do we want to remember the dead and what that means in history, that is going to open up a, a number of questions that that are are just not going, they're going to resist being represented, I think, in, in neutral, 
milk toast memorial forms. I just don't think that, that that's going to happen. And I think it is, um, it's just part of the history of memorialization that way. Great. I think uh, it's two o'clock, so I think we're going to leave it at that. Thank you very much, John, for a fascinating talk and Thank you, everyone. for Appreciate answering it. all of my le less than fascinating questions. No, that's all <laughs> good. It's fine. Thank you. Before you all go, please remember next week's talk is by performer Roxana Vilk and researcher Liam Bertels. They'll be talking about their new collaboration, Circle Daira, exploring inclusion, immersive experience, and shared space. They'll also be talking about the new wearable user interface that they've been building for live composing with light and sound. You can get news from all of our future talks by following us at PM Studio UK on Twitter, at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or the newsletter on our website. Please don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Give the video a thumbs up. The more subscribers we get and the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please feel free to share this link. Captioned version of this video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching and we'll see you here again next week.